Good morning. Welcome to worship. My name is Elizabeth Rand. This is Otto. We're from Monroe Street United Methodist Church. I'm one of the pastors at Monroe Street along with Pastor Larry Clark, who is preaching this morning. We are so glad we are worshiping together. We can't be together in person safely, but we are glad that we are connecting with God and with one another in spirit. May the peace of Christ be with you. Monroe Street is a reconciling congregation. It means that we're in ministry with persons of all races and ethnicities, gender identities, and sexual orientations. Our mission as a church family is to deepen our faith, engage our neighborhood, and become an inclusive community. We invite you now to join us in singing our opening song, 10,000 Reasons. Let us bless the Lord, oh my soul.
What makes us worthy? We are worthy because God made us so. God loves us, forgives us, picks us up when we fall. What is our response to God? In our worship today, we will explore what it means to live, live a worthy life. Lord, you love us because of who you are not because of who we are. You are the creator of all that is. And when your original work was done, you pronounced it to be good. Remind us that we are a part of your good creation, that we are fashioned in your image. You call us your children, members, of your family? How should we live to bring honor to, to be worthy of the family name? You have told us through the voice of your prophet to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly in your omnipresence. Through your son, the living word, you implore us to bring good news to the poor, to set free the captives, to give sight to the blind, to free all who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of Jubilee, a time of renewal for all people and for the earth itself. Through Jesus' actions, as well as his words, you call us to love and embrace the foreigner, the outcast, the least, the last, and the lost, and to do for those who could do nothing for us in return. Through him, you call us to action, not that we might be honored, but that we might bring honor to you and to the family name. Sadly, we confess that we do not always prove ourselves worthy of, nor bring honor to the family name. Indeed, our attitudes and our actions demonstrate that in those moments, we have taken your name in vain. When we abuse, misuse, and despoil the marvelous planet over which you have made us caretakers. We are unworthy. When we reject, exclude, and oppress your children because of race, skin color, nationality, religion, sexual identity, political beliefs, we are unworthy. When we discount and mock and belittle persons who are physically and or mentally different from us, we are unworthy. When we honor cleverness over integrity, we are unworthy. When we elevate self-acclaim above self-sacrifice, we are unworthy. When in your name, we take up weapons rather than the cross. We are unworthy. 
My God, who then can be worthy? No one can. If we set out to win, to earn the title of worthiness. All can be and are worthy who accept worthiness, who accept the family name as a gift from the father, the mother, the Abba, the Ima of all creation. O oh God, grant us the humility to accept the freely given gift of worthiness that our lives may be transformed by it. Now let us pray as Jesus taught to our gracious, holy, and loving God, our mother and our father who is in heaven. Holy is your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sin as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully mistreated at Philippi, as you know, we had courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of great opposition. We were gentle among you like a nurse tenderly caring for her own children. So deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you have become very dear to us. As you know, we dealt with each one of you like a father with his children, urging and encouraging you and pleading that you lead a life worthy of God who calls you into God's own kingdom and glory. Paul writes, we deal with each one of you, urging and encouraging you and pleading that you lead a life worthy of God. Paul is calling us to a worthy life. John Meacham, writes the following in his book, His Truth is Marching On. His steps were slow, careful, precarious, but John Lewis knew the way. And his gaze was steady, even peaceful, as he took in the old steel ramparts above his head and the brown asphalt under his feet. It was Sunday on March in a March 2020. On the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama, not unlike that first fabled Sunday 55 years before. He's walked this pavement before. On Sunday, March 7th, 1965, in a planned march from Selma to Montgomery, to protest the systemic exclusion of African Americans from the voting booth in violation of the 15th Amendment to the Constitution, still flagrantly ignored in the American South a century on, Lewis and his friend, Hosea Williams, were stopped by Alabama authorities at the foot of the bridge. Some on horseback, all wielding weapons, the white officers charged the column of nonviolent marchers. Get them, one white woman cried out. Get the niggers. Lewis was beaten, lying on the pavement. He was ready to die. It became known as Bloody Sunday, which ultimately led to the federal voting rights legislation. 
Robert John Lewis grew up in poverty, one of 10 children on a farm in rural Alabama. The house was small, just three bedrooms, counting the kitchen. There were cracks between the floorboards, no electricity, and water came from a well by the porch. Pages from Sears Roebuck catalogs were available for toilet paper in the outhouse. It was a life of extremes. The fireplace in the house provided overwhelming heat if you were near it, but cold set in just a few feet away. Same with the outhouse. In the winter, it was bitterly cold with the wind cutting through the cracks between the wood planks that made up the walls, Lewis recalled. You might as well have been outside for all the good those walls did. In the summer, it was the smell that did you in, with the heat turning that little hut into a tiny oven. When he was only 15, he learned of the lynching of the 14-year-old Emmett Till. He knew the dangers of confronting segregation of the South. The religion of the church he attended told him that what was important was to get to heaven where the streets were paved with gold. It seemed to me, he recalled, that the Lord had to be concerned with the way we lived our lives right here on earth, that everything we did or didn't do in our lives had to be more than just a means of making our way to heaven. Lewis would be arrested at least 45 times over the course of his life, fighting for justice and getting into what he called good trouble. Lewis went on to serve in the United States House of Representatives for 33 years, where he was referred to as the conscience of the House. Robert John Lewis lived a worthy life. The Apostle Paul called to the people of the church at Thessaloniki to live a worthy life. Paul knew the cost, as he himself was imprisoned on many occasions and would ultimately die a martyr's death. What does it mean to be persecuted for your faith on the way to living a worthy life? When I was in high school at our weekly Bible study, we would talk about being persecuted for our faith. We would talk about persecution as being called names like Jesus freak by other students. Well, it is not easy as teenagers to stand up to peer pressure. This certainly was not persecution in the sense that Paul and the early church had experienced it. I hear and read of U.S. Christians who talk about being persecuted for their beliefs even today. While there certainly is intolerance for certain beliefs on the part of some, I don't see Christians being arrested or killed because of their faith. What I do see more often is Christians trying to impose their beliefs on others. Religious persecution is real in our world. And it is certainly not exclusive to Christianity. Pew Research found that Muslims face persecution in slightly larger numbers worldwide than Christians do. Jews have been the target of persecution and experienced the Holocaust. Hindus likewise in certain places have been singled out. And Christians, Muslims, Jews, Hindus, and just about every other religious group has been guilty of persecuting those of another religious group at one time or another. Paul, early Christians, John Lewis, Martin Luther King Jr., and others have all experienced violence and imprisonment for their religiously held views. One could say they lived worthy lives. But is this a necessary condition for leading a worthy life? What constitutes a worthy life? And is this a necessary precondition to find favor with God? Worthy is defined as 
having adequate or great merit, character or value. Many people feel they are not worthy, either of love by others or even God. While we may have to earn the love of people, God's love is a given. There is nothing we can do to earn more love, and there's nothing we can do to cause God not to love us. Paul is not telling us we have to be worthy to experience God's grace. Paul teaches us over and over again in his letters that God's love and grace is a given. It is not something we earn. When Paul says he is urging and encouraging you and pleading that you lead a life worthy of God, he is saying that this is the appropriate response to all that God has and is giving us. We don't live a worthy life to earn God's love. We want to live a worthy life as a response to it. I believe that many people who have lives that spin out of control is because they don't understand or believe that they are loved by God or by anyone else. When we understand that we are a precious creation made in God's image, we will conduct our lives differently and live in a way that leads to a worthy life of great merit, character, and value. John Lewis knew he was loved and valued by God, and he knew that everyone else was too. So he worked tirelessly and selfishly to see that all persons were treated with human dignity and worth. He lived a life worthy of God. When we understand our worth to our Creator, our Redeemer, and our Sustainer, we too can live a life worthy of God. We may not be beaten or imprisoned for our faith, but we have the opportunity to make our lives stand for something. We can each make a positive difference in the lives of those around us in big and small ways. With the presence of God's Spirit in our lives, we can lead lives worthy of God. A worthy life is a testimony to God's love. Amen. As 
shall live. I will testify to love. I'll be a witness in the silences when words are not enough. With every breath I take, I will give thanks to God above. For as long as I shall live, I will testify to love. For as long as I shall live, I will testify to love. I'll be a witness in the silences when words are not enough. With every breath I take, I will give thanks to God above. For as long as I shall live, I will testify to love. For as long as I shall live, I will testify, testify, all my life I'll testify. Every breath I take, give thanks and testify, testify. I will testify to love. I will testify to love. I will testify to One way to live a worthy life is to testify to God's love. We are each unique, different, and do not think alike. And so we pray, what do we call you, O God? You who are above all and through all and in all. What do we call you when we know you in so many different ways? Eternal one, healer and friend, give us the grace to call on you. Remind us, O God, of your faithfulness in gathering your people. From dust you created us, out of captivity you delivered us, and through your prophets you directed us. Creator, Deliverer, Liberator, strengthen us to acknowledge our need to be made new. Enlighten us, O God, to the ways we neglect your presence in our neighbors daily. But even amid chaos, destruction, and despair, you used a rainbow as a sign of your enduring love. Light bringer, rainbow maker, and sun stiller, help us to see your brightness in those we have mistrusted and mistreated. Draw us together, O God, when we separate and segregate the body of Christ. You are with us and won't leave us to wander on our own. Emmanuel, Prince of Peace, Reconciler, Call us to right living with one another. You have shown us, O oh God, your way, your truth, and your life. Yet we diverge onto paths contrary to yours. Anointed one, true vine, good shepherd, lead us onto the path of righteousness. You have commanded us, O oh God, to pick up our cross and follow you. Instead, we have gathered rocks. Redeemer, Resurrection, and the Life, teach us to value mercy over judgment. Restore us, O God, and heal our wounds. We have been unheard, misrepresented, and attacked. Advocate, Comforter, Sustainer, enliven us to care for ourselves as we care for your world. Inspire us, O God, to live with all humanity and gentleness with all humility and gentleness, to preserve with patience, bearing with one another in love. Rushing wind, fire, spirit, consume us as we fellowship, sing, and give thanks with one another. We know you by many names, O God, yet you are one. While we make every effort, we are not united by our own doing, but yours. One Spirit, one Lord, one God of all, above all and through all and in all, make us one. Amen.
Look down from a broken sky, traced out by the city lights. My world from a mile high, Bessie in the house tonight. Touched down on the cold black tar, hold on for the sudden stop. Breathe in the familiar shock of confusion and chaos. All those people going somewhere. Why have I never cared? Give me your eyes for just one second. Give me your eyes so I can see everything. Does her best to smile at me, to hide what's underneath. There's a man just to her right, black suit and a bright red tie. Too ashamed to tell his wife he's out of work, he's buying time. All those people going somewhere, why have I never cared? Give me your eyes for just one second. Give me your eyes so I can see everything that I keep missing. Give me your love for humanity. Give me your arms for the broken hearted, the ones that are far beyond my reach. Give me your heart for the ones forgotten. Give me your eyes so I can see. Just moving past me by, I swear I never thought I was wrong. Well, I want a second glance, so give me a second chance to see the way you've seen the people all along. Give me your eyes for just one second, give me your eyes so I can see everything that I keep missing. Give me your love for humanity. Give me your arms for the broken hearted, the ones that are far beyond my reach. Give me your heart for the ones forgotten, give me your eyes so I can see. Give me your eyes for just one second, give me your eyes so I can see. Everything that I keep missing. Give me your arms for the broken hearted, the ones that are far beyond my reach. Give me a heart for the ones forgotten. Give me your eyes so I can see. Now may the love and grace of God go with you. May the Holy Spirit give you the power and strength to live a worthy life. May Christ walk beside you. Amen.